Welcome to the fourth in this series of reflections on the Book of Romans in association with Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, Santa Barbara, California. This past Sunday in worship, we heard the latter half of Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. As we did the previous Sunday, hearing the latter half of Romans chapter 3, so this Sunday, verses 13 through 25, and as usual, integrated with music and with a psalm and with prayer and so forth. And now, as usual, we have a chance to go back and to uh, pick up the part that was left out, the first 12 verses of Romans chapter 4. Before getting into that, I want once again to look back a little bit for just a minute on where we've come from. We've now finished uh, considering the first three chapters of, of Romans, and now we're going to be jumping into chapter four. And the question is, not only where we've come, where have we come from, but what, how is chapter four uh, connected? What, how is chapter four related to the first three chapters of Romans? Lots of people, of course, scholars and others, have tried their hand at outlining the structure of Romans of of laying out as explicitly as possible the organization of this text. I can say from personal experience that this is an extremely helpful exercise, outlining Romans, not only for in terms of understanding this text, but in terms of even of loving it. There's a lot of different uh, ways that one could, one could chop up or organize the text. But in general, people see that there is a overall uh, a fairly clear structure in the first four chapters of the book of Romans. And so I'll take just one example um, uh, from, from many possible examples and, um, and, and use that to, uh, to, to summarize where we've come from in the first three chapters of Romans. I'm using uh, an outline by the great Catholic biblical scholar Joseph Fitzmaier in his commentary on Romans from 1993. Like most people, Fitzmaier recognizes that there is a theme, that is a, a very important theme, that's introduced in the first chapter of Romans, verses 16 and 17, where Paul talks about the gospel as the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. And so Fitzmaier would say that there we have, as a sort of a beginning of this outline, there we have a theme announced. The gospel is the powerful source of salvation for all, disclosing God's uprightness or righteousness verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1. And then, getting into the latter half of chapter 1, and then all of chapter 2, and the first part of chapter 3, Fitzmaier talks about the uh, theme, the same theme here, but being negatively explained. And this, of course, is where Paul speaks about the reign of sin, and every, all human beings being subject to disobedience, and to, uh, and to unrighteousness, and, and so forth. The theme negatively explained, without the gospel, God's wrath is manifested against all human beings, going to the middle of chapter 3. And then, starting in verse 21 of chapter 3, when Paul starts talking about the righteousness of God, revealed or manifested in Jesus Christ, the theme positively explained. This time now, the gospel, the, the, the gospel showing itself, or being shown as the, the righteousness of God given to people. God's uprightness, or righteousness manifested to all sinners through Christ and apprehended by faith through the end of chapter 3. Now, this is the interesting part. What's the relationship of chapter 4 to all that? We've got the we had the announcement of the theme, the theme negatively explained, the theme positively explained. Fitzmaier would say something like this that here in chapter 4 we have an illustration of the theme and other people would say similar things, a case study or an example or what have you. And this is where Abraham comes in. Abraham is introduced in the first, very first verse of chapter 4 of Romans and is used as, uh, Fitzmaier would say, as an illustration of what Paul has been talking about in terms of righteousness, in terms of faith, and so forth. So that's where we are in terms of uh, our, motion, our movement through Romans. And before... And just before talking about some of the ideas that come up uh, in this first part of Romans chapter 4, perhaps it's good if I read it. So Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. What then shall we say was gain 
you know, discovered or found by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him, it was reckoned to him, it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes, but has faith in him who justifies the ungodly, that one's faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God's God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. It's a quotation from Psalm 32. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Romans 4, the first 12 verses. Now, obviously, anyone who reads this chapter after reading chapter 3 knows that it's continuing the, the theme and picking up the ideas that were already introduced, uh, particularly that of faith uh, as a way, as an access to, uh, as, a as a way to receive God's righteousness. And so it's worth thinking about that a little bit, this, this whole idea of faith. There are many different meanings of the English word faith, and that's probably true in other languages as well. It's, it can be ambiguous. And so it might make sense to try to think a little bit more about how, it's, how exactly it's being used here, or at least to try to, um, to, to rule out some possibilities. And one of the first things that one realizes, or that at least that I realized when I looked at this first part of chapter 4, the first 12 verses, which is all about faith, is that it doesn't mention. These 12 verses, this first part of chapter 4, do, does not mention Jesus Christ. Jesus is mentioned at the end of chapter 3. He's mentioned again at the end of chapter 4. But in this part of chapter 4, Christ is not mentioned. And yet, this part of the chapter is all about faith. Now, this suggests, it doesn't demand, but it suggests a question about whether faith whether we can think of faith, if we can talk about faith without mentioning Jesus specifically, can we think about faith as something like a neutral or empty jar kind of human capacity, a possibility within human beings that is ready to be turned or tuned like a radio to some particular uh, tradition or some particular set of um, of affirmations about God. You might think of it in analogy with language. People are not born speaking a specific language, and yet it's reasonable to suppose, it's re and there's been a lot of research on the idea that, that people, there's some sort of language capacity, some sort of language instinct with, that, all that human beings are born with, and that that neutral, you might say, linguistically neutral instinct is turned toward particular languages as the person who has that instinct is, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is, is trained and bred and, and grows up. And so might faith be like that too? This is tempting to think because it not only is it, uh, does it fit into the way that 
particularly in our time, shaped by uh, newer scientific discoveries and that, that way of, of looking at things. Um, not only does that it, it fit into that way of, of looking at things, but uh, it also is we're also encouraged by the simple idea of the word of the word faith as uh, when we th when we say there are different faiths um, or the word religion. We say that there are, there are different religions. This hasn't always been the case. The idea of religion as something as, as something generic and only finding particularity in these, specific uh, specific traditions, Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism or what have you, is a relatively recent development in human thinking. So, but it is, it is tempting to think this way. And it's a particular temptation today. This is why I, I bring it up, not only today, but um, today. Now, there are some issues, there are some problems with thinking about faith in this way. One is that it is teetering on the edge, not quite over, but teetering on the edge of a kind of blatant reductionism, saying that faith or, uh, or, or the, the whole line of thinking that, that uh, imagines that faith or uh, religion or what have you is nothing more than just motions of, of, uh, of neurons and synapses in the brain or just uh, can, be, can be exhaustively described by um, by that sort of that sort of way of describing human beings what the um, late Christian neuroscientist Donald Mackay called nothing buttery saying that religion or faith is nothing but neurons or some um, some scientifically describable uh, set of events uh, and the, the other uh, the other problem is that um, is 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 the question? Is there any evidence? Is there any is there any evidence that there is such a such a neutral capacity, a religious or or faith capacity within humans that's just waiting to be turned toward something particular? It's easy to speculate. It's easy to talk about these things, but it's not so easy to show that it's the case. One could say, for example, that astronomy and astrology are fundamentally after the same thing, just slightly different, uh, have slightly different tunings because they have the same, they're, they've got the same root. They both start with astro. But saying it, just saying it doesn't make it true. And one needs to, one needs to show that that's the case. And the same thing I think goes for talking about faith. This whole uh, this whole temptation to think of faith as something uh, neutral and that can just go in any uh, any of a number of different directions, I think goes hand in glove with uh, our current age's um, marginalization of the question of truth. Right? It's not a uh, it's it's not it's not asked. It's not generally asked. What is this true? Is this set of convictions about God and about the world and about the relationship? Is that are they true? Are, is that really the case? Instead, we have, oh, well, you've got religious beliefs of a particular kind. Good for you. Why don't you go be with your community and think the way and will and, and let others think in, in another way and all of it's fine. Now, this is a very complicated matter, but uh, none of this, none of this can be supported, actually, by Romans chapter 4, even though the first 12 verses do not mention with specificity, Jesus Christ. First of all, faith, as Paul talks about it, and indeed as the Bible uh, talks about it generally, is not a human capacity. It's not an originally human capacity in the biblical in the biblical perspective. That doesn't mean that faith in the biblical perspective isn't exercised by humans. It doesn't even mean to say that it's not a generic human capacity. It doesn't even mean that it doesn't have some sort of correlation with, for example, neural activity. But it is fundamentally, in biblical perspective, a gift from God. It's something that God allows and gives to human beings. Secondly, Romans 4, as anyone who reads the chapter and this particular part of the chapter in context realizes, is not about generic faith, but it's about faith in the God of the Bible. Of course, it's talking about Abraham, and Abraham, as we know, according to Genesis, Abraham's faith was in the God of Israel, the God who names himself as the Lord. And 
indeed, the identification of this way of talking about God as the God of Israel, the, as the God of Abraham, with the Christian way of talking about God as the God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, as Paul puts it at the end of chapter 4, the identification of those ways of talking about God are indeed the point. They're talking about the same God, and so faith in this God is not something generic but is indeed something very specific. And as we can tell by the, by the time we get to the end of chapter 4, does have a name, the name of Jesus Christ. Now faith in this chapter is contrasted famously with works. We can see that from the beginning in, the, in verse 2. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And then in the contrast in verses 4 and 5, the, for the one who works, his wages are not a gift. They are due to him. But to the one who believes, who has faith, righteousness comes as a gift from God. So works contrasted with faith. But what do we mean when we talk about works? Again, we have a, a, a potential problem of ambiguity here. What do we mean by works? Because works in the perspective of Paul and Romans, are not simply things that human beings do. They're not simply accomplishments, but they're accomplishments, things done, activities, and so forth, seen from a particular vantage point, interpreted in a particular way, interpreted so as to affect, so as to have some bearing on a human being's relationship with God. One is not justified by works, Paul says, it, which is another way of saying that one does not achieve a right standing, a standing of righteousness before God by means of one's works. So the works, to, to talk about works in this way means to talk about them seen from the perspective of the relationship with God. Now, all of this, it seems to me, is it's hard for us in the 21st century. It can be hard. It's typically hard for us in the 21st century to get our minds around. It's puzzling because in our particular cultural situation, we have little sense now in this age. We have little sense of trying or wanting to be righteous to have a particular kind of standing with God, to be approved by God. In our age, the anxiety of someone like Martin Luther, who was terrified, he was terrorized by the contrast between God's holiness and his own performance, that kind of anxiety tends to be foreign to us. Now, we may think that the absence of anxiety like that is a good thing. We might be tempted to think that Luther was just a neurotic. But if our lack of concern, if our lack of interest in that contrast is not based in the reality, then we're not in good shape. Now you might say that the language of the first part of chapter 4 of Romans is steeped in Paul's Jewish background and training, and that's true. He's using the example of Abraham. The language of faith and works is, 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 uh, is, is really shaped by uh, Paul's Jewish way of, of thinking and by his conviction that the Christian gospel is an outworking, it's a fulfillment of something that was, uh, that, that was given to us already in the Law and the Prophets, the Scriptures of Israel. And so we might be tempted again to think that this talk about works and particularly the contrast between faith and works is a kind of a byproduct of a Jewish way of thinking and therefore sort of irrelevant in uh, the the wider world the Gentile world that we have that we might that we might need to think of a another way of talking about the gospel but it seems to me that the the that to think that to imagine that this works versus faith contrast that Paul is talking about in Romans, that to imagine that that's not of concern to us is not so much because we're not Jews, or most of us are not 
Jews who are hearing this or reading it, is not so much because of that as because we tend not to think of what we do. We tend not to think of our actions and what comes from our our mouths and our lives and so forth. We tend not to think of that as somehow mattering to God, as somehow shaping our creaturely identity and our character, somehow factoring into our relationship with God. It seems to me that one of the things that this contrast between faith and works in Romans, particularly in Romans chapter 4, but of course throughout this first part of Romans, one of the things that it teaches us is that communicating and indeed arguing that who we are as human beings is fundamentally creatures before God, quorum Deo in the old Latin phrase, that our moral standing, our individual purpose and indeed our communal purpose, that our ultimate destiny are not things that we come up with on our own, but that they happen in relation to, in inescapable relation to, the holy, the law-giving, the judging, that is the truth-telling God. That realization, it seems to me, on the basis of a text like Romans 4, is key to our proclamation of the gospel today.